And then in 07, you went to the University of Chicago to the Booth School of Business to study finance, economics, and strategic management while you're at Procter & Gamble. So how did your education at UT, at University of Chicago, well, did it prepare you for your roles in marketing? How did you end up in marketing? Yeah, no, Juan, thank you for the, for the great introduction. Um, I would say along with a few other folks here, um, I'm an accidental marketer. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, if you think back to, I graduated high school in 1999 and it was sort of the height of the startup boom. So I was like, Hey, I want to go do one of these things. Um, so the best thing I think I thought I could do at that point was, uh, I have a family full of engineers and, um, I didn't know of any other thing to do, but to go be an engineer. So, and computers seemed like the right thing to go do <laughs> So at that time. So I got my uh, degree in computer engineering and, yeah, uh, when I got to P and G, I think I was uh, um, I was in their core um, technology group. So my job was to essentially figure out what technologies were BS and what were not, to see what applications it had for the broader enterprise. So um, everything from like you know high performance computing to you would you know you'd be surprised how much computing power um, it takes to model a diaper um, um, or um, you know, the other uh, products, uh, products like that. Um, so that's what I started my career doing. But one of the things that I did get to work on, this was pre iPhone, early part, early days of the Blackberry 20, 2003, 2005 um, was, hey, we started looking at because PNG had a global footprint, uh, we started looking at mobile marketing um, in the US to connect with uh, customers. And um, as I was evaluating technologies at that point, I got into, okay, this marketing thing is uh, kind of cool. Um, so um, accidentally got into that somehow at P&G. P&G let me into their marketing department and uh, um, off I went. Uh, but um, I would say that I was a terrible engineer. Um, so uh, I was looking for something easier to do. Not to say that marketing is any easier uh, in any way whatsoever, but uh, for me, I wasn't a great engineer and I had to find another career. And given the PNG let me do that, I just sort of stuck onto that. <laughs> I didn't let it go. Nice. And that was all up in Chicago, right? Uh, Cincinnati. Uh, Cincinnati. Iowa. Yeah. And I'd say, okay. you know, like the biggest thing, right, from the from my education is probably problem solving. Um, yeah. As an engineer, it doesn't matter what kind of an engineer you are. And I'm sure the engineers in the audience can relate to that. Uh, the one thing I think you get really good at is problem solving. Um, so, um, and, and there are a million approaches to problem solving and you, you learn half a million of them when you're an engineer. So that is, I would say, the biggest sort of advantage or benefit that I've gotten from my education per se. Um, I did not take a single marketing class through high school, college, or MBA. So I learned marketing at P&G. Wow. All right. Right, I, I concur. Problem solving seems to be about 75 to 85% of our job these days. Um, all right, so Ashwin, uh, you've been in the marketing business now, media business for 15 plus years, right? Yeah. So we've seen quite a lot of shift in the media business and in marketing over the last 10 years or so. Um, and in relation to the theme of the 10th anniversary for brand innovators, I've got, I got a question, and, but it's in two parts. Yeah. Right. So considering how our industry has changed over the last, I don't say five, 10 years, even how is HEB keeping pace? Yeah. Okay, that's one. And, and then just taking a step back, how is your marketing overall? Do you feel your team has been successful? Kind of what, what lies ahead for you guys? Got it. I will. Uh, so I'd answer it in two ways. Um, I think despite, you know, all the media changes, I think media has been changing for a lot longer than 10 years, right? I mean, it's, uh, well, it evolves yeah. over time. Um, um, it, it evolves with the technology of that time period, right? Um, and essentially what that means for the customer is that attention spans are different. Attention is fragmented. So you go where the attention is, but throughout that, regardless of what the media channel is or where our attention is, I think the most important part in all of that um, is um, you are, you're creative in the sense that are you able to get someone's attention in a way that's valuable to them? And if I think about HEB um, over the years, 
what we are known for is our creative in the sense that, you know, five years ago and 10 years ago, it was our television commercials. And, um, you know, we are a regional company. Uh, we serve Texas. Our purpose is to improve the lives of Texans. Uh, and, um, but our, we punch, uh, you know, way above our weight class on a global scale. And the, way, the reason why I say that is one example is that um, if you think about what we've done with our Spurs commercials, we sponsor the San Antonio Spurs, who are the hometown team here, um, along with uh, professional sports in Houston and other places. A lot of our commercials, again, again, this is, you know, five, 10, even like a few years ago, um, was being used by the NBA and the NFL as examples of how other teams can activate their sponsorship uh, with professional teams uh, from by the league office. And that was an example of, um, creative shining through for that particular medium. So as media changes, I think the biggest challenge for us is, okay, now you literally have two seconds to get someone's attention, whether it's on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram. How do you make sure that your creative uh, still absolutely stands out regardless of the medium, whether it's audio from a podcast standpoint or a video from a streaming or TikTok standpoint? Um, if your creative doesn't stand out, it doesn't matter. Now, Getting to better creative, I think you have a lot more things at your disposal. Um, so that's where you use data to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, you use other insights before you go make anything to say, are you on the right track? So the tool set and the capabilities you have to get to make great creative, I think is a lot more than where it was 10 years ago. But ultimately, uh, you got to find a way to add value to customers and do it in a way where uh, you know, they will stop scrolling on their phone for one second. Right, right. And I imagine that that, uh, I mean, with the creative, based on the, depending on the platform that you're going to choose to run it on your creative changes, right? You're going to have shorter creative, obviously, for mobile and longer creative for the big screen, right? It does. And I mean, it goes deeper than that, right? Like, I mean, like, if you think about TikTok as an example, um, you know, half your work is done for you. It's, you know, like, the trends on TikTok are pretty clear, right? So the question is, creatively, how do you play up to some of the key trends that uh, that are running? So uh, versus for Instagram, I think is very different. The same thing that works on TikTok, it's not going to work on Instagram um, right. or any or Pinterest even for that matter. So yes, your creative is different by um, by mobile versus television, but even within. Um, the various mobile apps, you know, your creative has to be very specific to how people consume that app and consume that medium. Right. And yet Which is still where a lot of our investments other. are going through now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. And, and we talked about this the other day, uh, as much as my company and my charge is to focus on the media and the data and where your consumers are really watching TV or streaming TV, et cetera. Like you said, it, it doesn't matter if you find every you, where they're all at if your creative sucks. <laughs> exactly right. Um, the big topic of the day, obviously, is COVID and the pandemic, right? Um, it's it's almost built into every conversation we have. It seems. Yeah. Um, what are things that have changed at HEB or at a, in HEB's marketing approach since the onset of this pandemic? Um, a few things I would say, um, you know, your decision-making time frame I think is a lot shorter than it was before, um, where during COVID, we had to make major decisions very, very quickly to react to what was happening. So when products were not on shelf, when we had challenges with supply chain during Snowwood here in Texas, um, or when, um, you know, you had to react to, okay, what is your policy on masks? Like, the decisions that we used to make before COVID were typically pretty drawn out for the most part. The, the time frame for making decisions, I think, um, shrunk, I would say, by 60 70%, right? What would take you a week or two to make a decision, you're making it in hours, a day at the most, right? So that, that's one. I think tactically, I think in terms of uh, what we did during COVID, for example, you know, in the grocery industry, in the retail industry broadly, uh, most people send a lot of paper. <laughs> mail out to you. So grocery specifically, you send what you would call a weekly preprint, right? Uh, but uh, the weekly specials of the day, and that's been happening for literally 100 years. And most retailers do that. Um, and um, 
for us, what started was, hey, people don't want to touch paper during COVID. They don't want to touch anything during COVID. So let's stop sending paper. That was, uh, you know, if COVID hadn't happened, right, that is a decision that would have literally taken a year to make because you'd want to go study in every market. You'd want to go figure out what the, what the uh, impact is to sales, what the impact is to margin, uh, what the impact is to your perception as a low price leader, all of this stuff. We made that decision literally in like two weeks. Say, nope, we're not doing it anymore. Off we go. So we had to find a way to reinvest that money into something else. Uh, now, your your goal when you, when you do your you know something like the weekly preprint is to drive the price impression to get trips into the store. That objective didn't go away. You had to find a way to get that other uh, get that objective done, but you're just not doing it in print. So that is a very tactical example of you know things that have changed um, pre COVID versus how we operate now. Right. So you, you just said, you, how do we still get people to get in the stores? Right. Yeah. But at the onset of COVID, nobody wanted to come into the stores, like for a whole different reason. Yeah. And they were staying at home. For instance, we, my family immediately started using Shipt, which is yeah. in partnership with HEB. We don't have HEB here yet, <laughs> no. um, but we, we, um, we buy Central Market all the time and, and Target as well. So talk about making quick decisions. That's a lot of pressure to almost change the yeah. way you're doing business on a on a on a dime right yeah um you know i think uh, you, but you have to react to what's happening right that's why i think you you can't be toned up to say okay like people are worried about germ like you know early on in covid we also didn't know a lot of things right we didn't right. know how the virus was being transmitted was it is it from touching surfaces is it from touching is it just airborne there was a lot of misinformation out there and it wasn't clear what the science was very early on right so we had to react to that to say the last thing someone wants to do at this point is to touch a piece of paper. Um, so, so that made the decision a little easier. Um, um, but, you know, we haven't gone back to it. We don't plan on going back to it. So uh, we might use it, you know, very surgically in certain places. But, um, you know, you have to react and you have to see and you have to read the temperature in the room, uh, you know, in some ways to figure out what you're doing. So, um, but from a broader driving people into the store standpoint, you know, that's one thing that we don't worry about as much. We are um, very lucky to enjoy um, a ton of market share in the, in the areas that we operate. Our store experience is probably the best retail store experience. And I'll put that up there with anyone anywhere in the world um, because our brand, you know, like, you know, um, I know the previous examples of Bojangles in a way, you know, as most Texans know, we are a cult in Texas in a way. Mm -hmm. So because our brand experience and our product experience inside the store is phenomenal. So driving people, when the pandemic was over, driving people back into the store wasn't as much of a concern because you knew people would come back um, because of who we are, but you have to sort of give them a reason to, you can't just rest and say, yep, they're going to come back. You still have to start playing your game and going on offense once certain things, when it comes to supply chain and it comes to, are, are we ready to get people fully back? You know, when you make those kind of decisions, then you, you know, you press play in your offense and go. Yeah. Would, would you say you always have to kind of be ready to reinvent yourself? Almost like a, a good entertainer does, right? I mean, you have to do that every day, right? It's not yeah. just reinventing yourself, but you also have to prove yourself every day. And that's sort of right. how I've always operated is you can't rest for a single day. Um, you just can't take anything for granted. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the brand loyalty. Uh, this is something that I wrote down that I wanted to touch upon because it, as somebody that lives in a market where HEB has not yet yeah. jumped into the game, right? Yeah. Uh, however, uh, I think it was just yesterday that, we, that you announced that you were coming, you were going to open up a store in McKinney, the Texas, which would, would be, area, yeah. which would be the third in DFW and, and people around this part are going crazy. What is it about the HEB experience in store that j literally drives that loyalty. I mean, my mom will tell you she loves the big open wide aisles so she can ride, drive her cart straight down the middle and not bump into anybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's quite a few things, right? For It starts with price. I think we are typically the lowest price in, in most product frame in any market that we go into. But what we don't compromise on is a few things, right? Um, our quality is better than most. Um, if you think about who's in that market, uh, our quality is better than most, uh, if not the best in the market um, across our, our 
you know, our meat products, our seafood products, our produce. The second, the third thing that we do really well is our assortment. Um, so our, like, for example, with our, um, with our own brand products, we don't put it out there until it beats a national brand in a performance test. Um, um, it, it, we won't launch it. Um, and, but you have to build that story and you have to tell that story. It takes a while to tell that story. Um, and then along with that is our assortment of distinctive items. Well, we take pride in bringing products from all over Texas that no other retailer has. But I'd say the biggest thing is every single one of our stores is tailored. Meaning that literally you can walk down a store that's a quarter mile away and you'll have differences in assortment. So every single store at HEB is tailored to the neighborhood that it serves. Um, so, um, and then combine that with our prices and our assortment and our quality. And then we do a lot of theater in store. So sampling is a big thing that we do in store. Um, we, we, uh, we make a lot of products in the store that we sell fresh. So the tortillas are you know, a great example of people going crazy that people go crazy for. So I think it's a combination of things along with our service from our partners. Um, we call uh, each other partners from an employee standpoint um, that I think it's, a, it's, it's not one thing. It's like eight things that all add up um, and doing that every single day. Yeah. And, and you know, but, but what you mentioned, right, is, okay, uh, there are two things. How do you build that when, you know, there, there's a generation that's not going into the store, right? How do you build that loyalty with them? And how do you build it in a new market that doesn't know much about HEV? Those are all, you know, challenges I think we have to work through. I think we have ideas on how we're going to go do that. But um, it's, it's not like we're bulletproof if we don't uh, continue to improve. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like, you know, because of your, your market share in the state of Texas, you know, it's like the old, it's like that Kevin Costner movie. If you build it, they will come. Right. Yeah. So now that you're well, building them in well, the yeah, DFW you can't assume area, that though, from a marketing standpoint, <laughs> that's the thing you get like, if you do, uh, you'll be caught dead. Right. Exactly. So I don't assume that. So you still have to do what you always do well and continue to tell these stories in a way. Now, again, the marketing landscape, as everyone has said, is so fragmented. So, and every single, you know, panelist on here is fighting for the same attention on the same phone screen. So it's a question of you as a customer, what am I going to do differently to get you to pay attention to me versus Frito-Lay or Bojangles or anyone else? That's a challenge that we all face right now. Yeah. So challenges, challenges in the grocery, talk about challenges in the grocery category overall. And, and kind of how would you describe the evolution of that space um, from your perspective? I think the biggest theme that you're seeing, right, is this concept of convenience. And convenience comes in two forms. One is how do you get your order fulfilled? So with, uh, you know, you shop online, you go pick it up in the store. Like, you know, you pull up to the curb, we, what we call our curbside business. You have your home delivery business. And there's a lot of competition for home delivery between the retailers uh, Instacart, Ship, Amazon, Walmart, everyone's sort of trying to figure out how do you make that work. Um, and then the third part of uh, convenience is meals, right? Ready-made meals that are fresh, that are not, if we're not talking about lean cuisine microwave meals, we're talking about fresh meals that are ready to go, that takes your cooking time from an hour to five minutes or 10 minutes, but yet you still feel like you're getting a fresh cooked meal, right? So, um, and I'd say, um, so that's one big theme is that is the biggest evolution that I've seen in the last five years is this evolving need for convenience. Um, um, so that's one. The second, I think what you're, you know, seeing more and more is um, prepared food and competition with restaurants. So, you know, we have, uh, if you think about barbecue, you know, Texas Monthly rated uh, True Texas Barbecue, which we own and which it's, it's within HEVs the number one barbecue spot. Now that's arguable, but depending on how much barbecue you eat, but like you wouldn't expect, and what, they didn't rank as number one grocery store barbecue. They ranked as the number one barbecue in Texas, which is a big deal. So this concept of prepared meals from a restaurant standpoint, you'll see more and more within grocery stores where that is becoming an option. So we can solve your problem that every, every sort of person has, you know, right about this time of the day, Hey, what am I going to eat for dinner? What, what am I going to feed my family for dinner? So how do I, you know, take a trip or two away from you going to a, an actual restaurant is a challenge that I think all grocery uh, companies are working towards. And you sort of see that 
in the evolution of what people are doing. Um, so I would say those are the two biggest sort of battlegrounds, but that doesn't mean like, you know, price is always a big thing. Your assortment is always a big thing. So there are fundamentals that you can't ever lose, but the evolution of how convenience shakes out um, and uh, what does the prepared meals and um, restaurant food look like? I think that's another one. Right, right. All right, so let's take a step back. I, we've been talking about a lot of different things. Um, thinking of the HE brand, HEB brand overall, what do you do to keep it strong? I mean, you, we talked about reinventing yourself a lot. What are you, you going to have to do for the next five years to keep that HEB brand the number one share in the state of Texas? I, I, you know, look, it starts with the experience that customers have with HEB, right? There's nothing I can say from a marketing standpoint that customers eventually won't figure out if it's BS. So, you know, we have, we are the largest private employer in the state of Texas. We have 135,000 plus uh, partners that work uh, for HEB. It's what they do every single day inside our stores that, um, uh, that matter most. How are we serving our customer? Because, you know, Kurt, as you know, our our number one sort of uh, marketing maker is actually the uh, the brand, the fan love, the brand love that we get in our communities uh, because of what the experience is through our products, through the stores, uh, through online. So I think we got to continue to make sure that we we innovate there and we uh, we don't take a step back there. I think number two is how do you continue to highlight uh, the key stories to tell. And this is where, from a core marketing standpoint, my job is to figure out what are the right stories that resonate that everyone should uh, to hear about or everyone should see, right? What are the right, uh, who are the right partners that can help me get, you know, uh, reach um, the right customers at the right time? Um, so there is an element of personalization in terms of how do you story tell uh, the right story to the right person? Um, there is an element of you know, from a mass storytelling standpoint, what are the main stories that I want people to know about in a world where people can't pay any attention to anything anymore? Um, so we have to, and, and that flows from what our experiences in the stores for customers every day. There's a ton we do around the community that, again, if you go back to our purpose, right? Um, it's helpful that we are a private company because we can choose to make less money to invest in the things that we want to. Improving the life of Texans is something that's been with us for the last 120 years. So in that sense, because we are a Texas first, Texas only company, um, you know, we get a ton of credit because we do this, not because it's a marketing thing. Um, we get more credit than FEMA when it comes to, and the state resources when it, when, during times of disasters and hurricanes. That is not a purpose marketing thing, right? That is, we live in these communities, our partners live in these communities. Uh, we need to serve our own communities. And that's why our response is what it is that we're, you know, we're known for it. And, and um, so as long as we continue to take care of Texans, I think um, I, my job is to figure out what are the right ways to tell that story and what are the right platforms to tell that story. Yes, there's a lot of math involved there as well in terms of figuring out CPMs and efficiencies and connected TV. And ultimately those are all sub bullets under the broader umbrella of uh, what are people going to care about and what are people going to pay attention to? And figuring that out, I think, is probably the um, biggest thing, especially as attention spans to dwindle. That's a great message. You have to take care of your, your communities first. Um, you don't hear that from a lot of companies, right? So you guys are Texas strong through and through, Texas first and Texas only. But you have dipped your toe outside of Texas before. I don't know that it has held, right? So are there plans for expansion outside of Texas? Well, we have stores in northern Mexico, and, and but it's, you know, it's a separate sort of division. Um, we, it's not like we share a ton of resources. So it's, uh, we have, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, between 60 and 70 stores in northern Mexico. But for now, uh, in the U.S., it's Texas only. Um, and there is a lot of room to grow with Dallas-Fort Worth, which we are super excited about expanding into. Um, there is a lot to grow in Houston and Austin. I mean, Texas as a whole is growing there is a lot to do here and there's a lot to uh there's a lot of uh room to um you know get to our financial goals just by staying in texas so um the focus is texas yeah well and and expanding into dfw what other markets are there that that, that 
in Texas that you haven't gone into that you might see up on the on the dashboard? Well, the only other one outside of DFW is El Paso, which is way out there. Um, so if you hear, you know, people ask. <laughs> hey, they count too. <laughs> uh, so right now the focus is on DF DFW next. Um, so, but again, our goal is to make the lives of Texans better. So you have to slowly figure out how do you serve every corner of Texas. Um, it's it's the right time to get into DFW for us. So which is sort of what we're going into. When you when you go into markets, for instance, you're going to come into the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, which has central markets um, spread throughout. Um, is there some sort of competition between the two? No, I think we serve different. Uh, our company, uh, I mean, with yes, central markets are part of HEB, and to be clear, they have been in Dallas for 20 years, so we have a lot of learning from them on mm -hmm. the Dallas Fort Worth market. But no, they serve a different customer, and they serve. Um, you know, if I think about the purpose of the core essence of Central Market um, is it's about the food experience. It's for the foodies. And, you know, they innovate when it comes to food trends. They are, you know, we learn a lot from them in terms of uh, what's coming up from a food standpoint. Um, but uh, there isn't, uh, I would say, competition per se between us. I think we serve different folks. As far as I recall i don't remember seeing the barbecue in central market <laughs> uh i haven't been into central market in two months, <laughs> so i don't know uh. um so you, you you've talked about there are two different customers one for central market one for heb and I, i'm not i don't want to talk about central market too much yeah i want to find out who is your customer because when we on on our side of the business we talk about the grocery category it we try well Everybody is your customer who doesn't yeah. grocery shop, right? Yeah, well, you're right. So if I think about HEB, right? So part of our strategy, if you compare it to others, is that because every single one of our stores is tailored, um, we serve uh, folks who are on um, SNAP and food stamps um, to uh, people who are very, very, very well off, right? So they're like, we serve, HEB, the core of HEB, the core HEB brand serves every single Texan across the entire economic spectrum. And that's why stores are very tailored, products are tailored. Um, if I think about central market, they're focused on uh, the customer where the customer was not price sensitive. They are focused on the customer who really, really, really wants the upscale food experience, um, who are into food trends, the foodies, right? So there's a difference in who we serve and how we serve them in terms of the yep. products that are carried. There isn't a ton of overlap between HEB products and central market products. So that is a that is a difference as an example. Yep. Well, everybody I've talked to, friends of mine that are in Dallas, but transplants from say Houston or San Antonio, they can't wait because they all talk about this, the HEB products, the, your own products, right? Yep. Um, so when you say one's for foodies and one maybe not, it sounds like a lot of foodies are excited for the HEB brand to come. <laughs> well, we're excited to go up there. Again, we, we have a lot of learnings from Central Market, so it's, it's going to be a battle, no doubt. Right on. Very cool. Well, thank you both for a great conversation and uh, you, and for closing out our day, the second day of the 10th anniversary for Brand Innovators. Some common threads, so um, which basically, Ashwin, you hit all the common threads that were kind of coming through and all the speak from the speakers today. I think the first one really that came from Jackie is marketers. One constant for them is driving demand, which Ashwin, you, you've been talking about. But the key thing is now we can measure that, right? We couldn't measure that before for everything. Import, importance of brand purpose and driving consumer insights, uh, you know, taking care of Texas first came through with what I heard from you guys, which is awesome. And then competition redefined as the consumer's last best experience. And that could be the last grocery store or convenience store they were in or the last restaurant. And then, you know, through and through putting the consumer first and we had ampersand, uh, that is a big focus for us, which is the importance of a uh, solid audience strategy that um, circles around the consumer to follow them along their journey, as Kimberly mentioned earlier from Volkswagen in our day. So with that, uh, I wanted to kind of circle the wagons on the conversation I started at the beginning of the day, which is 
our mission at Ampersand to empower brands to reach consumers across all screens. And I have more fun facts to share uh, specific to this effort. So at Ampersand, as I mentioned, we optimize national TV campaigns by leveraging our proprietary viewership data to create audiences of underexposed TV viewers combined with other important attributes to target those viewers. So as a fun fact generated from the insights from Ampersand, on average, effective reach for any given brand is 14% for national TV campaigns. When we incorporate Ampersand Media to optimize that national TV, we have demonstrated that we'll increase the effective reach by 10 to 18%. And if a brand is getting efficient, you know, effective uh, reach on a regular basis, it does drive business outcomes. And we've seen on average uh, that we can, through Ampersand Media, that we could drive web visitation or sales lift by 20 to 30%. So there you all, save you for many more fun facts. We hope to, that you'll all join us tomorrow, June 10th, for day three of the Brand Innovators 10th anniversary, 10-year outlook. It's at 12 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be joined by other brands, big brands like American Eagle Outfitters, Blank Fitness, Current, Pernard Ricard, Reebok, and many more. Thanks again for joining, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.